This is the Dungeon Master's Handbook. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Dungeon Master's Handbook. I'm Michael Chicago Wiz. Glad you're here with me. Um, side note to start off with, the opening music, um, I found this on a place called the uh, Free Music's uh, Archive, and uh, really enjoyed it. Um, the, the whole song, Dragonaut, is, is really cool. But the uh, artist that I've linked to who goes by the name of Bradley, is not the actual author of this song. Um, and I had a, a commenter uh, recently remind me of this. When I first started putting the podcast together, I wanted to find some music that I could use that was freely available and, and kind of cool and kind of reflects kind of my take on D&D. Um, and so I found this. But in researching the song, I found out that it was actually made by a band called Sleep. Now, I had never heard of Sleep before, and I should have because I'm a heavy metal fan. And uh, they were really popular in the 90s. Um, they uh, made a number of albums. They were, uh, Wikipedia has a quote, that they were known as the ultimate stoner rock band. Uh, and I can kind of see why. They, they've got that uh, 70s psychedelic uh, vibe to them. And uh, uh, I actually have ended up listening to sleep um since uh the the comment so uh thank you for reminding me and i did want to point that out and uh if you get a chance uh go hunt down sleep i'll put a link to their take on a uh, dragonaut and uh you can tell me what you think uh side note when i did do the the initial uh, findings for the podcast, you know, trying to figure out the music and all that and the licensing. I wrote to um, both Sleep's uh, label and to uh, the label that this guy Bradley uh, supposedly released the, the cover under. Never heard back from anyone. So I'm using it. Don't sue me, please. <laughs> All right, uh, so this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about a question that came up in um, from Reddit, of all places, about how I stock uh, monsters and treasures in my dungeons. Um, and that's a really interesting question, and, and there's a couple of things that um, I, I want to point out about my approach to, uh, to how I do it. So we're going to take a hypothetical dungeon. Uh, we're just going to work on the first level. And uh, it's not important about the layout of the dungeon right now because what we're talking about is what kind of monsters are going to be in there and what kind of treasure is going to be in there. Now, a couple of ground rules to, that I hold to um, when I'm stocking monsters and treasures. First off, monsters, um, the way I do experience points is a little bit different than the way um, stock Advanced Dungeons and Dragons does it. All right, so I open up my monster manual and let's take a knoll. I'm not saying the knolls are going to be in this hypothetical first level. Now, in the monster manual, they don't list the experience points, but they give you the hit dice. And you have to go back to the DMG on page 85 where it says, hey, this knoll for two hit dice, the basic XP value is 35 points. And then you award XP for uh, each hit point, which could be three. So average would be nine hit points. So we've got 35 plus nine times three is 27. So 62 hit points on average or 62 experience points, sorry, on average for a null. That'd be a hell of a null for 62 hit points. <laughs> My players would kill me. Um, I don't do any of that. I'm, I'm simple. I'm lazy. What I end up doing is I actually go back to the original Dungeons & Dragons where they didn't do, they didn't even tell you how to do experience points for monsters. Um, I've got the uh, Men in Magic Volume 1 the first booklet, and I'm on page 18 where it has this whole I example on experience points. Now, they're talking about killing a troll. 
and they say that the troll is a seventh level monster as it has over six hit die. Remember, this is OD and D. And the uh, the values they give, they, they say that they're going to give them 7,000 gold pieces for uh, that the troll had, plus 700 experience points for killing a troll. So if they rate it as a seventh level or seven hit die uh, for experience purposes, probably because it has a special ability to regenerate, six hit die plus one, seven. Um, the math is seven hit die uh, divided into 700 experience is 100 experience points per hit die. Sold. That's what I do. Uh, makes it easy for me at the end of the day. I can just basically count the number of monsters, what hit die they had, multiply it by 100. That's the experience you get for killing a monster. Now, this does have the effect of speeding up um, advancement to some degree by, uh, by making the monsters a little bit more, um, what do you call it, you know, you get more experience for them in the beginning. But as you get up there, um, and, and if I remember correctly, I'll have to do the research on this. Uh, Daniel Collins of Delta's OD&D blog, I think he did a comparison, and the 100 XP per hit die flattens out as you get higher levels. So you end up getting more for lower level mooks, but as you uh, start fighting the uh, higher monsters, you would actually get more experience per the DMG rather than the 100 hit. 100 experience points per hit die. Whatever, I use it, that's what I do. Now, why is it important? Because my second rule, remember the first rule is 100, hit, 100 experience points per hit die of creature. The second rule is, is that I award about two to three times the amount of gold value in treasure as to what appears in that dungeon level. So if I have a thousand experience points in monsters available in my hypothetical dungeon, then I'm going to average out about two to three thousand gold pieces worth of stuff that the players can get in that dungeon. Now, where did I come up with that from? Well, with that, I'm going to go to another book. This is the Swords and Wizardry Retro Clone. Um, if you've never seen Swords and Wizardry before, it's uh, I think it might still be free on the internet. Um, this was released in 2008-2009 by a gentleman named Matt Finch. Um, Swords and Wizardry uh, basically simplifies and is a OGL interpretation of uh, OD&D. &D. Um, so uh, this is one of the ways that back in the late aughts, people were trying to reinvigorate um, you know, excitement and interest and explore the uh, original version of Dungeons & Dragons. At the time, the PDFs weren't available anymore for OD&D. Um, there, there wasn't the interest uh, by Wizards of the Coast in, uh, in making them available. So uh, this is what a lot of us did, is we went to these retro clones and we worked on them and uh, got really into them. Now, what um, Matt did here was he had his own rule of thumb that said, you know what, you really need about two to three times the monster's value in experience points for treasure. Um, because the idea is it, it takes a while to level up and you really want to level up by amassing wealth. Again, in you know, with the older versions, the idea was is that you would progress in levels and wealth and power so that you can essentially rule your own kingdom. Um, and uh, in keeping with that, then you want to award more treasure than killing monsters. So those are the two rules. So when I think about a dungeon, um, there's three things I really want to... Um, focus on for the players. First is making it interesting and unique. Um, I, I want each dungeon to kind of have its own flavor, its own flair, its own atmosphere, its own you know vibe, if you will. Um, to me, I like dungeons to be places where the rules of the surface don't necessarily apply. Things are not always what they seem and they shouldn't be. 
You should be a little creeped out. You should be a little paranoid. Uh, why is this door not opening? Hey, I opened this door five minutes ago and I just returned. Why is it closed? Why is there stuff dripping off the ceiling? Why is this corridor completely bare and clean? You know, stuff like that. Um, so, I, you know, it doesn't necessarily make the monsters and treasure, but it may because if I want this atmosphere to say be spooky and creepy with monsters that maybe have mutated then I might take goblins and suddenly now they're mutated by chaos so they act a little differently they look a little differently they explode when they die you know that kind of thing um, so that kind of influences me as to what monsters I'm going to use by the atmosphere the second thing is, is I like factions and groups of monsters in my dungeon. Um, whether those factions may be, you know, friendly to each other or in competition, I like a dungeon to kind of have its own, be its own little world. You know, the goblins are hanging out here, the mongrel men are hanging out here, the kobolds are in between and they're getting picked on by everybody. Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So generally, um, when I uh, am thinking about a dungeon, uh, you know, I've got the atmosphere. Now I'm going to think, okay, what makes sense to me and my campaign to have in there? Why would they be in there? And are they going to work with each other? Are they in competition with each other? And what clues can I give for the players to give the players something more to do than just going in and clearing out the dungeon? You know, maybe they're going to make it easy on themselves. They're going to befriend one faction and use them to wipe out the other faction and they get all the treasure. You know, that counts for experience. You uh, you led an army of kobolds against the goblins. Well, you know, now the goblins are eating well and you have all of the, or the kobolds are eating well and you have all the goblins' treasure. Ta-da! Um, so, you know, with the kind of those two things in mind then, I kind of let my fingers do the talking. I have a copy here of the Monster Manual 2. And what this nicely has, and this is for, again, AD&D First Edition, this has um, monster random encounter tables. Now, this is back in the back on page 133, and it lists all of the monsters from not only the Monster Manual 1 and Monster Manual 2, but also from Fiend Folio, which I love. Um, I, anytime I want to get weird, I go to Fiend Folio and get inspired. Um, and this makes it nice because not only does it lay out which book, it's broken this out by monster level uh, for the dungeon. And then I can also uh, go through this and look at, um, thumbing through to the, uh, through the indexes here, uh, you've got outdoor, you've got aquatic random encounter tables, and then it has dungeon monsters by level and frequency at that level. So this breaks it down even further. So if I look at level one monsters, you know, common is bandit, bat, beetle, character party, hill dwarf, mountain dwarf, goblin, orc, rat, giant rat, shrieker, and throat leech. Ooh, throat leech. Wonder where that one is at. Um, and the Monster Manual 2 also very nicely has an index. So if I go over here and I look for throat leech, that is in uh, Fiend Folio, page 88. Let's go get Fiend Folio. Uh, nice thing about having the bookshelves right next to you. Okay, a throat leech. Oh, this is like the... Uh, oh, this is like the other lovely little uh, um, monsters the, uh, that uh, jump out at you. Uh, anyone drinking water containing a leech takes it in his mouth unless the water is carefully filtered before drinking. Um, the leech will fasten itself on the soft flesh of the back of the victim's throat. Oh, <laughs> oh that's brilliant. I love Fiend Folio. I'm definitely using a throat leech at some point in the future. Uh, players be warned. So, um... Yeah, I use Fiend Foley, or I use Monster Manual 2. I go through, um, 
I collect up a bunch of monsters or I reskin monsters if there's something that I want to achieve. And then I will go through the various books and figure out, you know, what's the you know, number appearing and, you know, get an idea for that. And then I'll start to divide them up. And, you know, this is stuff that you know, I'm sure you already do. You know, how you take the monsters and you divide them up and put a few here, a few there. There's a lead here. There's maybe, you know, some going there. Um, and when I create my dungeon encounter table the, for the random encounter tables uh, for wandering monsters, usually I'll have groups peeling off so like the guards may be wandering around so that if the players run into them, then they, assuming that they successfully, you know, get through that encounter, if they've taken care of those monsters, I'll scratch it off the key from that room. All right, so you show up later, there's a bunch of uh, cots and fire burning and treasure is there, but no monsters. Congratulations, you've already taken care of them. Um, and, and so for me, that kind of makes the dungeon feel a little more, you know, integrated and things are kind of linked together. And, and the players catch on to that after a while and sometimes they'll, they'll even use that to their advantage that they know what's happening or they'll you know interrogate them you know what do you know about what's going on down you know down the corridor that cor that kind of thing okay so stocking monsters pretty straightforward it's not really all that hard um i think the hardest part is just coming up with the theme of what you want and the numbers and, and where you want to put them you know coming up with you know maybe a memorable leader um i also always try to have at least one other monster that's you know going to be a fun little npc that they run into um, if they take the time to negotiate with the monsters and talk to them um i personally love uh spores molds and funguses um, i use them quite a bit um i the gelatinous cube rocks for me. I love using gelatinous cubes. Um, I love dropping slimes down on players. I love making traps out of those kinds of things. Uh, there's nothing like the players stepping in a pool of water and not realizing that they've stepped into the middle of a gray ooze, which you can't really tell it's there underneath the water surface. Good times. All right, so now we get to treasure. And this is one where, again, um, I, I, I break from the book a little bit. Um, certainly, if you want to, you can go ahead and you know use the Dungeon Master's Guide and, and the treasure types. And, uh, and sometimes I will do that. Now, I will take full use of the internet at this point. Um, when I am ready to start uh, laying out my treasure, I open up three or four tabs in Chrome. Um, usually that's one that has the treasure type uh, generator on there um, and I'll, I'll put a link to a couple of my favorite ones another one I will open up is the swords and wizardry treasure generator and I'll talk about that in a minute as to why um, and then I have a bunch of other little odds um, you know uh, tables and things that I've picked up uh, over the years um, some of them take uh, treasure and make it into really interesting items um, two tables that I, I use that a lot for are by a blogger named Taichara and what they came up with was uh, they called them little treasures but it's these really intricate names for things like you know an inlaid uh, a gold statue of an elephant with tusks of real ivory and inlays of silver across the body and eyes made of rubies you know that kind of thing it's right there and, and you know it's just easy enough to copy those down change them a little bit and and now I've got something that stands out for the players rather than it just being you know gems and jewelry there's something unique here that that makes this memorable to them um, so treasure. So as I mentioned, I go for two to three times the amount of XP. And so I'll have a number in mind. Let's say 3,000 gold pieces. Now, at this point, um, I take one of two approaches. Um, I will go ahead and quickly run through the treasure type generator and uh, make sure that I don't uh, you know, come below that two to three thousand, and I try not to go too far above that. Um, 
or I'll use the Swords and Wizardry generator uh, that I found online because it's already kind of set up for that um, for the two to three times and I'll use that to generate a little horde and then distribute that among the monsters and the leaders. Now um, when it comes to magic so uh, this is one where um, I, I will actually go back to the book and roll for or I'll use the swords and wizardry generator to roll for um, but I take the GP value and I do deduct that from uh, what the uh, what the players might get. So if they were going to get three thousand, uh, you know, gold, and here I'll open up the the DMG real randomly, and let's say they get a ring of contrariness. Well, that has a, a one thousand GP sale value. Well, now they're only going to get two thousand gold pieces worth of treasure, and then I'll I'll, I'll go from there. Um, another thing I will do is. Not all treasure is guarded by monsters. So um, I may have a chunk left where if I've already awarded all of the treasure, to, you know, ran through all of the monsters and I still have some gold pieces left, well, now that's going to become hidden treasure or that's going to become stuff that happens to be laying around um, or it might uh, end up influencing me to go ahead and create, you know, some magic items and, and have those as extras. Um, I, I like the idea of hidden treasure because once the players grok into the, you know, maybe they should poke around things a little bit more, open a few more doors, poke at corners a little bit more, um, then it gives you a chance to do some interesting things with your dungeon. Um, I like to hide things in statues, or I like to hide things in altars, or, you know, behind, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here, um, like in a library, all right, so, you know, the players went into a library, they were poking around, well, the books themselves actually had some value, and there were a couple of tomes in there which were very old and ancient, and if the players took the time to find them, they would have a rich hoard there because they would be able to sell those for many hundreds of gold pieces. Um, so it's stuff like that. And and I'm, you know, I'll give clues, you know, oh, you, know, you found a book and it looks really ancient, it's in really good condition, and it looks like it might be valuable which now gives them you know, a little mini quest to go and find a sage that might know something about the book and give them some loot for it. Um, so I'll do some things like that. Kind of running out of uh, ideas here. Um, it's pretty much what I do. Just use a lot of uh, you know, little generators and things and, and kind of you know, let inspiration guide me. Um, one of the things that, that kind of frustrates me about the treasure types is that... Uh, you know, it can take a lot of, when I run through them and I generate out the treasure, a lot of times the monsters just don't even have anything close to what I feel like they should have in terms of uh, treasure. So I will end up sometimes letting uh, my own judgment and uh, my own wishes override what the uh, treasure types have. Because as I said, I like to stick to that two to three times rule. Um, it makes advancement a little bit quicker, but for my campaign that actually works out because we only meet once a month. Um, if we were meeting a lot more often, I might have a, a, a different approach, but uh, this works for me. Uh, the other thing that I've done is within my campaign, um, I don't expect players to walk around with thousands of gold pieces or to how to be able to store them. So I have a, a faction in or a guild called the Merchants Guild, and what they have done for the players is award letters of credit, um, so or letters of deposit. So the players will, you know, give them the five thousand gold. They are handed back basically a note, and um, you know now they have to walk around with those notes. Of course, what the players don't know or haven't really thought about is, oh, did you just get fireballed? and you had that uh, note of deposit, let's make a couple of saving throws and see if that burned up or not.
So, you know, there are ways of separating players from their treasure. Um, the other thing is, is, is uh, you know, I, I, I uh, encourage and quite often put the players in situations where they have to hire hirelings or they have to hire specialists. And all of those cost gold. And so, you know, I have those ways of separating the players from their money. I'm sure you will find many ways of uh, doing that in your campaign. Um, one thing I did veer away from was taxes. Um, I, I was doing taxes where, you know, the players would come to town and the, the guards would, you know, basically tax them for whatever loot that they had found. Um, that didn't really go over well and it kind of ended up being a distraction. I don't do training costs um, because I've always found it a little odd and I never did it. Uh, when I was playing, and so I generally don't do it as, as a dungeon master. Um, but um, there are other ways that I come up with things for, uh, for the players to have to give up their money as they gain levels, uh, maybe helping out with the church or with whatever military organization they're with, or, you know, there's some dues that you have to pay into the Thieves Guild, what have you. Um, there's always things that you can come up with. All right, so I think I've rambled on enough about uh, treasure and stocking. I hope this was useful for you. Um, let me know in some comments what you think and if you have more questions. Um, that's about it. I um, hope you will come back and listen again in the future. Uh, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and uh, give me some reviews. Let me know what you think. Let me know how I can improve the podcast. Uh, I've been doing this for about six months now and uh, would really like to know how I can make it better. All right, that's it. Until next time, game on. Game on.